an unsolved mysteries. It rained down from the heavens like a plague, tiny toxic blobs of goo that brought an outbreak of flu-like illnesses to Oakville, Washington, and left behind a perplexing mystery that may never be solved. 20 years ago, a young doctor ventured into the Chinese wilderness seeking knowledge about the ancient and mysterious art of Qigong. Today, AIDS patient Salem Babbitt believes the teachings of Master Hong Lu have given him a new lease on life. He's known as a ruthless operator with a hair-trigger temper. He's a reputed godfather of New England's Irish Mafia, and now he's a fugitive. Have you seen James Whitey Bulger? In California, a house is torched to cover up the murder of a young woman and the abduction of her infant son. Now the boy's father, rap music artist Lathan Young Lay Williams, needs your help to solve this disturbing case. Join me for this intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries. from the skies to wreak havoc on the earth. Strange blob-like droplets that look something like this. It sounds like a bad science fiction movie, but for a small town in the Pacific Northwest, there was nothing entertaining or fictional about the scourge that befell them in 1994. Six times it rained down from above, leaving dozens of local residents ill and several pets and small animals dead. It all happened in Oakville, Washington, population 665. Here in Oakville, clouds fill the sky daily, bringing rain some 275 days a year. So when it began pouring on the morning of August 7, 1994, no one was particularly concerned until they realized it wasn't raining rain. It was raining tiny blobs of gelatinous goo. It came down in torrents, blanketing 20 square miles and brought with it something of a plague. I got sick, my wife got sick, my daughter, uh, everybody that lived here got sick. Everybody in the whole town came down with like a flu, only it was a really hard flu. It didn't last like seven days, it lasted like seven weeks, to two or three months. A local policeman was among the first to report the perplexing precipitation. Officer David Lacey was on patrol with a civilian friend at 3 a.m. when the downpour began. on the window there. I don't know. I have to build it up. Is that inside the car? We turned our windshield wipers on, and it just started smearing to the point where we could almost not see. And we both looked at each other, and we said, you know, Jesus isn't right. I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere, basically, and, and where did this come from? Officer Lacey pulled into a gas station to degoo his windshield. As an added precaution, he put on a pair of latex gloves. That's really weird. The substance, it was very mushy. Uh, it's almost like if you had jello in your hand and, you know, you could pretty much squish it through your fingers. We knew it wasn't something that we would normally see because we had never experienced it before. So we did have some bells go off in our heads that basically said that this isn't right, this isn't normal. Local resident Dottie Hearn was equally baffled. By the time she stepped outside that morning, the storm had ended, but the blobs were everywhere. It looked like hail laying on top of the wood box and everywhere else. So I just went over and I touched it, and it wasn't hail, it was a gelatinous like material. Hi. Have an appointment to By mid afternoon, 
Officer Lacey had inexplicably Please taken Lacey, ill. Right that was to the point where I could hardly breathe. I started to put together that possibly whatever the substance was, it, it made me violently sick, you know, and ill, like I'd never had been before, to the point where, you know, it just totally shut me down. Across town, Dottie Hearn wasn't faring much better. I started feeling dizzy. Everything started moving around and around, and uh, it got worse. And as it did, I became increasingly nauseated. Mom! An hour later, Dottie's daughter and son found her sprawled on the bathroom floor. Have you been throwing up? Yes. Dottie, she's sick. She was cold, uh, drenched with perspiration, pale. My mom had been vomiting. She had extreme vertigo. She complained that she had difficulty with her vision. Her vision was blurring. Dottie would spend the next three days in the hospital. The diagnosis, a severe inner ear infection. For some reason, as we were going out the door, I remembered the substance. And I wondered if perhaps it might have had some sort of an effect on her, if it might have made her sick. So I opted at that moment to take a sample of this gelatinous material to the hospital. A lab technician found the first startling clue. The substance contained human white blood cells, but exactly what it was and why it fell from the sky could not be determined. The goo was promptly forwarded to the Washington State Department of Health for further analysis. It was very uniform. There was no structure that we could see visibly or, or with a microscope. Uh, I set it up on various microbiological media and uh, attempted to isolate uh, bacteria. Mike McDowell discovered that the sample was literally teeming with two species of bacteria, one of which makes its home in the human digestive system. The initial speculation was that it might have been human waste from an airliner. And that would make sense. You would expect to find something like a human white blood cell in human waste. However, the FAA ruled that out because under the regulations, human waste is dyed blue. The substance was not blue. It was crystal clear in color. All told, the blobs rained down upon Oakville six times over a three week period dozens of people took ill. Several dogs and cats reportedly died after coming in contact with the toxic droplets. Included in the death toll was Sonny Barcliffe's eight-week-old kitten. But the nature of the substance and any connection it may have had with the outbreak remained a mystery. Here we have sample number 12876. Okay. Nearly a year after Dottie Hearn's illness, she took a sample of the material she had stored in her freezer to a private research lab. I saw what I think was a eukaryotic cell, which was, is basically a cell that has a definable nucleus and is found present in, in biology, in most animals. Translation, the goo was alive, but how in the world did living matter make its way into the clouds? The explanations are as mind-boggling as the substance itself. Perhaps inevitably, the finger of suspicion was soon pointed directly at the military. Someone uh, theorized that since the Navy had been conducting live bombing runs at sea, they might have blown up a school of jellyfish. And of course, this jellyfish would have been thrown up into the air um, and floated 50 miles inland and over a period of three weeks fallen six times in the month of August 1994. I find that somewhat preposterous. Now, if that were jellyfish uh, floating around up there for that long, they would have smelled a high heaven. The Air Force confirms that practice bombing runs are being conducted over the Pacific in August of 1994. However, they deny any knowledge of the unknown substance or any involvement in creating or dispersing it. The locals don't buy it. 
We had a significant amount of military aircraft flying over the home uh, prior to this happening. Every day almost, uh, slow flying bombers, helicopters, all black in color. And uh, we kind of thought maybe it might have come from them. They let off things in the air all the time here, and testing, you know, there's testing done all over the place. There's a lot of places you can't go into. Maybe we were a biological experiment of some kind, a, a small one, maybe just get people a little bit sick to find out, say if an enemy did come over here with a biological bomb or something and dropped it. Um, maybe just a test run to see how, to, how it would, what would happen. Translation, germ warfare. However, that seems unlikely, given the severe international restrictions regarding experiments with biological weapons in populated areas. At present, it's impossible to say what the strange goo was or where it came from. Unfortunately, all samples of the substance are gone, making further study impossible. Perhaps the answer will come someday soon, when the skies open up over another small community and the blobs once again fall to Earth. Next, on a college campus in Texas, two brutal rapes, one unknown assailant. Now the suspect is identified and on the run after a chance encounter with one of his accusers. Perhaps the most shocking of all crime statistics is that one out of every three women in the United States will be sexually assaulted during her lifetime. One of three. Occasionally, even the safety of a college campus can be violated by a sexual predator, as it was at Texas A&M University in January of 1995. The rapist hid his intentions behind a show of normalcy. He was just a jogger. He looked like any other student. When the jogger ran by the victim, he ran out of sight, then turned around and came back. She didn't feel at that time that that was really strange because of the fact that there were a lot of joggers that, you know, go to a certain area, they turn around, they come back, and they may come back the same way or they may continue a different route. Hey. Hi. A chilly evening tonight. Yeah. It's... Uh, the coffee. This is a knife. The suspect kept Please. telling the victim do to do what he told her to do. Get on your feet. He also kept that night within her sight, and she had every indication at that point that he would use that knife on her. 30 minutes later, the rapist disappeared into the shadows. University police soon released a composite drawing and character profile of the suspect. He was probably a college student. He would strike again. He would use that knife. We had to catch this guy. We had to identify him. We had to find out where he was. And we had to prevent him from uh, performing another sexual assault. The profile was right on target. Three months later, a knife-wielding assailant attacked another Texas A&M student. She was very frustrated that she couldn't overpower him, uh, but from nowhere, she said, a knife appeared and was placed against her throat. He threatened her. He told her that if she screamed, he was going to kill her, and therefore, she complied with his instructions. He then took her to a nearby field. There was about five foot tall grass, and he had already matted down a six foot diameter area so that the grass was real low, which is where he then sexually assaulted her. The site was chosen, but not necessarily the victim. He just waited for the right one to come by and then took her to the location that he, was, he had already prepared. This composite is based on the second victim's description. When compared with the first drawing, it bolstered investigators' fears that a serial rapist was stalking the campus. Upon reviewing the information that we had, we became very concerned that if it was indeed the same person, if he had committed one and committed a second, there was most likely going to be a third and a fourth and so on until he was stopped. Authorities wallpapered the campus community with posters. However, the sketches could only deal in generalities. 
The suspect had straight hair, not curly. He was young, not old. White, not black. A lot of people end up saying, yep, looks like just any regular person. Uh, even the second victim that I had interviewed in depth, she made the comment too, just looked like a clean cut student. The critical break came from the first victim herself. In November of 1995, 10 months after the assault, she stopped for groceries at a local market. Have a good day. Thanks. Howdy, how you doing? Hey. Fine, thanks. This is a knife. Do what I say, and I won't hurt you. We're gonna go for a little walk. Okay? Okay. That'll be 4257, please. Can I write you a check? Sure. The crab meat is a knife! Can I see your driver's license, please? Driver's license? Yeah. The young woman was convinced. She was face to face with a man who raped her. Excuse me. Hey, you forgot something. Police would soon learn that the clerk was named Don Richard Davis Jr. He was scheduled to graduate in three weeks from Texas A&M. Detective Villarreal, this is Detective Lindholm with the Texas A&M University Police Department. Hi. We're investigating the two rapes that took place on the campus last year. Your name came to us as a little look alike. Yeah. Now, this is just routine, and we've already interviewed more than 70 people, but I'd like to get your picture for a photo lineup. Sure. His demeanor, his posture, even his physical continence was very timid, very sheepish. But interesting enough, uh, we started to really study that picture and look at him. When you started to really look in those eyes, they didn't match the sheepish behavior that we had seen. The eyes ended up reflecting a very thoughtful, aware, focused individual. When this photograph of Davis was shown to the second victim, she too identified him as the rapist. DNA was the clincher. Police say that preliminary tests showed with 90% certainty that Davis and the rapist were one and the same. In January of 1996, Don Davis Jr. was arrested and charged with aggravated sexual assault. Those who knew him were incredulous. Teachers praised his abilities and his works. His peers liked him very much. He had lady friends, both within the university and outside the university environment. Uh, some described him as a very handsome young man with, with good manners. Uh, there's a lot of people that think very highly of him and can't even perceive of him ever committing these type of offenses. When I heard these charges, I was in disbelief. I thought, there's got to be some mistake. Don's not that type of person. He's, he, there's nothing aggressive about his personality. Um, and I thought it was a case, I still think it is a case of mistaken identity. However, investigators say that the final DNA test results have left little margin for such an error. The evidence was pretty overwhelming and conclusive that uh, out of all the white males in the world, he was a one in five million on one incident and a one in five billion in the other. Don Davis Jr. was released on bail of $150,000. The court ordered him to stay with his parents and observe a 10 p.m. curfew. On August 20th, 1996, six days before the start of his trial, Davis did not come home. Coming up, the authorities say Whitey Bulger ruled the Boston underworld for more than 20 years. Now they need your help to track him down. But first, the mysterious art of Qigong. Can this ancient Chinese practice harness a body's natural energy to help heal the sick?
Chinese, energy is a force vital to all life. They believe it flows through our bodies like blood through our veins. The Chinese also believe there are a rare few who can control that energy. Healers who have mastered an ancient and mysterious art known as Qigong, literally the exercise of energy. Canton Province, southern China, 20 years ago. Yeah. Hong Lu, a young doctor from Shanghai, climbed to a cave hidden high in the mountains. Lu had grown up in a family of physicians schooled in traditional Western medicine, but he suspected there was more to healing than science. The isolated cave was the home of a Qigong master named Quan a man who reputedly could diagnose illness with a single glance and perform cures without even touching the patient. Sounds out. For eight long years, Hong Lu worked with Master Quan, learning how to tap the energy of the universe to find enlightenment and heal the sick. Today, Dr. Hong Lu is one of 12 Qigong high masters in the world. He lives in Southern California and is the only one of those masters practicing in the United States. Qigong is not a miracle cure. Qigong can improve health. Qigong can cure some illnesses, but it cannot cure every illness. I really wanted and hoped that there was somebody out there that had a magic wand is going to wave it over me and say, oh, you're cured. You have your full use of your left side back. That's, that's the kind of, you know, that's where I was coming from at the time. That time was December 1994. Salem Babbick, accompanied by his mother, made his first visit to Master Lou. Salem was in the final stages of AIDS. He was partially paralyzed, losing his vision, and had recently been diagnosed with PML, a brain virus that is swift and deadly. You okay? I remember asking my physician, maybe a month or so after I was diagnosed, do you have any other PML patients? He says, yes. And I said, how are they? They said, they're all dead. Master Lu claims he can simply look at his patients and see where the qi energy flow is blocked. Then he uses his own qi to help clear the path. The session had barely begun when Master Lu's apprentice removed Salem's leg brace. Next, Master Lu told Salem to rise. Stand up. Okay, don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. Okay, close eyes. I was amazed. I couldn't believe that I was standing without the aid of anything. Okay. Okay. It felt like something was coming into my body from afar, from behind me when Master Lu was working on me. It felt like something, something was penetrating my skin and as a result making me stand upright. Every time I felt myself leaning this way or leaning that way or falling, he would just push his energy into my body and that would make me stand upright again. It was like shadow boxing, in a way. My son would start going to one side. He would bring the energy from his body toward my son without touching my son. And he would straighten up. He would start going to the other side. He would go from the other side. It was, it was, it was a most incredible thing to watch. From that day on, weekly sessions with Master Lu were a regular part of Salem's therapy. The good part is that he is also using Western medicine. So that's why I think if I use Qigong with Western medicine and they work together, what will happen? The effect has been positive. You want to have a backgammon tournament tonight? Why not? To Salem, the result was nothing short of miraculous. 
Within six months, he had regained 80% of the mobility on his left side and could walk without a brace or crutch. Salem's dramatic improvement amazed everyone, especially his Western doctors. I was quite surprised to see Salem recover in the way that he did. In my experience, patients with AIDS and PML uh, do not uh, improve. They deteriorate. It's clear that for the moment at least, Salem has beaten the worst odds. His doctors credit a new approach to drug therapy that uses a combination of AIDS drugs rather than one at a time. Salem, however, is convinced that Qigong was a crucial component. I cannot say Master Lu cured me, but he definitely brought me to the road of recovery. If you can imagine coming from the point of being diagnosed as somebody who's just as good as dead to where I am now, I mean, it's just, I'm elated. I'm totally elated. Salem Babic is now one of thousands worldwide who practice Qigong, sometimes in group sessions like this one. Debbie Patella has a bone marrow disease, a condition that is often a precursor to leukemia. For Debbie, Qigong is a full partner in her therapy. It's not a cure, but a way to alleviate the side effects of drugs prescribed by her doctors. I don't have any of the symptoms anymore. I don't get the headaches. I don't get nauseous. I have tried everything. You name it. Nothing has ever given me the energy that Qigong has done for me. I wish I would have known about it a long time ago. I feel like I'm me again. <laughs> How it works, I don't know. I don't know. But I honestly feel it worked for me, and it can work for others. In 1993, Randy Hebert says he was diagnosed with an aggressive form of prostate cancer. Three doctors told him he should have surgery. Instead, he tried Qigong. Skeptically, with uh, one eye kind of open and the other one kind of closed, I started to go to him. Master Lu put Randy on a macrobiotic diet, taught him exercises to do at home, and gave him treatments three times a week. I know that other people he has worked on, uh, they, they've gotten into trance-like states. Uh, I never did, but I did feel something going through me, something, almost like heat. After working with Randy for three months, Master Lu made an astounding pronouncement. He said to me, the, the cancer is gone. And I still get goosebumps to this day. And that uh, I, I said, what did you say? And he says, the cancer is gone. Randy scheduled another biopsy immediately. How are you doing today? Well, the results right. appear to confirm Master Lu's diagnosis. Good news for you. You do? Yes. Your biopsy results are negative. There's no sign of cancer. That's great. Over the next That's year great. and a half, Randy had three more biopsies. Okay. No All were negative. Um, but I want to you the Nevertheless, it will take more than one case to convince a medical community that Qigong is an effective treatment. We'll do biopsy every six months. Despite 4,000 years of history, I think that Qigong and other uh, forms of alternative therapies really need to be held up to the same uh, light and a burden of proof, burden of evidence that traditional medicine is held up to. Modern medicine solves many problems, but it has some areas that need improvement, more research and development. Qigong, generally speaking, is a good supplement. That's why I recommend Western medicine combined with our method. This is more guaranteed for the patient. Officially, the American Medical Association has no opinion on Qigong as a legitimate healing technique. Next, join the search for Whitey Bulger the reputed godfather of Boston's Irish Mafia. And later, a rising rap star searches for his infant son and the people who kidnapped him.
6th January, six men are scheduled to go on trial for extortion and racketeering here in Boston, Massachusetts. The star witnesses will be several of their alleged victims. But authorities have every reason to fear for the safety of those witnesses. If the trial were to start today, one of the defendants would be conspicuously absent. He is perhaps New England's most notorious fugitive, Whitey Bulger, the reputed godfather of the Irish Mafia. James J. Whitey Bulger has been described as a throwback to the gangsters of the 1930s. Quick-witted, hot-tempered, ruthless. A petty thief turned bank robber who spent nine years in federal prisons, including Alcatraz. After his release, Bulger allegedly established an empire in South Boston. According to the authorities, Whitey ruled his turf with an iron fist for more than 20 years, and in the process earned an estimated $25 million. In his heyday, Whitey Bulger operated out of the back of a liquor store on the edge of South Boston. Hey, how are you doing, Sean? Good to see you. Late one night in 1989, he allegedly arrived to take care of some unfinished business. Relax, Jimmy. Reportedly, Whitey's associate, Stephen the Rifleman yeah, Fleming, was waiting inside. Right, Their guest of honor was a local tavern owner named Tim Connolly, whom Whitey had allegedly targeted for extortion. Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Sit down, sit down, sit down. How's your family? Good, Jim, thanks. Good. Timmy, I got a problem here. I get this guy, he owes me $40,000, and he decides the way he's gonna pay me back is take a mortgage out on his house. Get that paperwork in. Yeah, yeah, and uh, something's happening here, and my friends aren't helping this guy along. Whitey. Whitey! God, Whitey! I want some respect from you, Jeff! I jerk. respect you, Rick. Oh, I'll show you some respect. This is respect! This is respect! Timmy, That's respect! You. That's respect! Timmy. That's respect! I'm gonna let you buy your life for $50,000. That's, that's $50,000 by the end of the week. I, I can't get it all to you. Oh, yeah, well, it's good you come on a good day, huh? Because I'm gonna let you give me 25 in two days. Two days later, oh. Tim Connolly claims he did the only thing he felt he could do. He returned yeah. to the liquor store with $25,000 cash. How are you, Tim? Good, Jimmy, yourself? Good, good. Going down to Florida? Yeah. Yeah, I'm leaving in the morning, Jimmy. Good. Bulger realized that he got half of the money back and Conley had promised the other half, and that everything was forgiven. Conley claims that Bulger then came out, put his arm around him, and said, now you're our friend again. Thanks. But Tim Conley apparently did not feel as enthusiastic about the friendship. He went to the FBI. They, in turn, began building a case against the so-called Don of South Boston. James J. Whitey Bulger came from a prominent local family. His older brother, Billy, is a former state senator and the current president of the University of Massachusetts. But by all accounts, Whitey was a wise guy from day one. In South Boston, you very often had, in real life, angels with dirty faces, where Jimmy Cagney is the bad kid and Pat O'Brien becomes the priest. That happens over there. I know many families that have a, a priest and a gangster in the same family or a, a gangster and a police officer in the same family. It's very common in that culture. South Boston is an insulated Irish Catholic community, a place where Whitey Bulger, known to his friends as Jimmy, felt right at home. Talk to Frankie. Uh, yeah, some of his guys don't know uh, where North ends and South begins. Listen, we got to talk to Frankie. We got to get that straightened out. South well, Boston yeah, really believes down. that we look out after our own. And that's what Whitey Bulger was all about. In South Boston, Whitey Bulger was widely viewed in the working class as our gangster. Yeah, he's a wise guy. Yeah, he'll hurt you if you deserve it or if you cross him. But he's a gangster with scruples. He's a guy that will keep an order, a certain order to the underworld. People maybe loved the fact that, that they felt that he took care of the community, that he would be the guy that would carry the groceries of the elderly woman that was you know, getting out of a taxi and trying to get up to her apartment, um, or would help a little boy that um, maybe he had a dog, his dog died, would go out and buy a dog for a little boy. But he also was viewed as somebody that you didn't cross. Oh, wait, look who we got here. Hey, hey, Bobby, come over here. Bulger reportedly had no qualms about flexing his muscle in full view of the neighborhood. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, Steve. Nice seeing you both. It's not nice seeing you, Bobby. Steve, they're going to close me down. Last month, I had to come up with a double month's rent for these people. 
Steven, I, I swear, if I only... Bobby, Friday, 2 o'clock. Friday, 2 o'clock. Jimmy. Whitey Bulger absolutely controlled what went on in South Boston. In fact, nothing happened in South Boston without his approval. Um, every bit of illegal gaming, loan shocking, drug dealing, he had a piece of it. If it happened, he had to sanction it, and he had to have a piece of it. From time to time, the feds brought Whitey in for questioning, but they never had enough evidence to nail him. For all intents and purposes, Whitey Bulger was untouchable. Whitey Bulger is the master of eluding surveillance. He learned quickly um, how to avoid, you know, being caught. He never said anything incriminating in any confined place. And he had a real habit of conducting all of his business outside. But the Boston Globe has reported there was another reason Whitey was never busted, that he was actually working with the FBI as an informant to bring down the Italian mafia. I think there was always a split within the FBI. I think there were some agents who, for their own reasons, wanted to use him as a resource and probably liked him at one level. And I think there were other agents who, who looked at him and said, he's just another gangster. Those are the people we're supposed to be taking off. What I can tell you is that uh, when it comes to matters within the FBI involving informants and sources uh, and witnesses, cooperating witnesses, the, we just do not talk about that. That is not something we speak about in public. John Gamble has been on the Bulger case since 1990. By that time, Whitey had set up his office on Castle Island at the tip of South Boston. Just across the harbor was Boston's busy Logan Airport. You have planes coming over, you have joggers running by, you have dogs barking. It is a perfect uh, location to avoid uh, having people like me listen to you. What do you think? Bulger also used a technique the FBI has labeled disciplined randomness. When I was watching Whitey, he might be sitting and talking with somebody, and I have literally seen him having a conversation with somebody, look at his watch, and go three benches down and sit down and continue that conversation with these people 10 minutes later, and then move again in 10 minutes. I've been there when it was 20 degrees. I've been there when it's 94 degrees, and uh, he's been out there. He had a select group of trusted um, associates, and they would be the go-between. They were the ones that would go out and deal with bookmakers and loan sharks and pick up money to bring back to Whitey. Very rarely did Whitey make an appearance and actually have a face-to-face -face confrontation. He left other people to do his dirty work. But unfortunately for Whitey, he made an exception in Connolly's case. I'm gonna let you give me 25,000 in two days. Now get out! And if I don't get the rest of it, this is you! Tim Connolly turned to the FBI because he was scared. And I think um, Connolly decided that it was time to start talking. <laughs> Are you implying that Mr. Bulger threatened you, Mr. Connolly? Connolly provided authorities with the evidence needed to build a federal racketeering case against Bulger. In January of 1995, Whitey was indicted, along with his associate Stephen the Rifleman Fleming. Also indicted was Cadillac Frank Salemi, the boss of New England's Italian Mafia. But in true Whitey fashion, Bulger managed to slip through the authorities' grasp. I think that the law enforcement um, rushed the arrest a little bit because they were worried that they were, they were going to lose their, their intended targets, that they would all take off. And so they grabbed Stevie Flemmy, and when they did, they were unable to locate Frank Salemi or Whitey Bulger. Six months later, they found Frank Salemi in Florida, but they have yet to find Whitey. I think a lot of people who have had dealings with Whitey and who are going to be witnesses in the upcoming case um, are probably nervous about, about the fact that he's not in custody.
Next, a house set afire, a young woman murdered, the four-week-old son of a rap musician abducted. His name is Lathan Williams, known to his fans as Young Lay, a rising star in the rap music world, and now a young man at the center of a bizarre double mystery. A tragedy that has torn from him the two most important people in his life. A case that has stumped police in Vallejo, California for months. In the spring of 1996, things were going well for Lathan Williams. He had recently signed a recording deal. This new video was about to be released, and his girlfriend had just given birth to their first child, a boy named Lazan. What I feel about Lazan was, it's a first son, you know what I'm saying? I'm finna, uh, the summer finna come, you know what I'm saying? I'm finna uh, be with him, you know what I'm saying? Take care of him. It was, and it was experience to me, you know what I'm saying? And I was happy. Lathan's girlfriend, 17-year-old Daphne Boyden, lived with her grandmother in Vallejo. Daphne was working hard to finish high school while caring for baby Lazan. On May 17, 1996, Daphne's grandmother, Reva Lee Boyden, was getting ready to go to her weekly bingo game when the doorbell rang. Is Daphne home? Yeah, come on in. She's in the back. Daphne? Yeah. You have company? Daphne was getting a lot of visitors. She was a mother of a local rap star's baby. Everybody wanted to see Lathan's son. We just came by to see the baby. Oh, yeah. so cute. Y'all can sit down. Daphne, I'm going to play bingo. I'll be going a couple of hours. Reva Lee didn't recognize these two girls, but Daphne obviously knew them. Everything seemed fine. Reva Lee couldn't have been more wrong. An hour later, she was rushing home. Neighbors had told her that her house was on fire. She had no idea whether Daphne and Lazon were still inside. They tried to break loose. He said, no, no, don't go in. So he said, your granddaughter's dead. Daphne was dead. The news grew worse. None of it had been an accident. Daphne had been murdered, the house torched to cover up the crime. And there was more. Baby Lazon was missing, apparently kidnapped. For Lathan Williams, the shock was devastating. He couldn't believe they were both gone. I was saying, please, to myself, please, Daphne, come walking around this corner, you know what I'm saying, with this baby, you know what I'm saying? Daphne's death outraged the community. Hundreds turned out for a march memorializing Daphne and urging Lazon's safe return. The question on everyone's mind was why. I did hear that some girls were threatening her. And I didn't understand that, you know, but they said it was behind my son. I don't know for sure or not what the situation is, but it seems to me as some, apparently somebody wanted a baby and they wanted to do away with her and why, I don't know. Daphne herself was a 17-year-old girl that uh, attended school, did well, uh, seemed to be well-liked. Uh, the problem was that she did have this uh, baby uh, that was fathered by a uh, up-and-coming rapper in the area. Uh, he was uh, signed to a contract and was uh, actually doing quite well, and uh, we initially felt that possibly there were some jealousies that had been aroused in uh, competing females for Lathan's affections. Is Daphne home? Yeah, come on in, she's in the back. Daphne? The obvious suspects were the two girls who had visited Daphne the evening of her murder. Daphne? They were first seen just before they arrived at the house by a neighbor who wishes to remain anonymous. I saw Two girls on the same side of the sidewalk. 
One of the girls, she had like a black tote bag. She unzipped the bag and pulled out something which appeared to me to be a rope. You got the light? Yeah, sure. I got everything clear. All right. When they were walking past by me, you know how you watch scary movies and you get scared? That's the kind of feeling I had inside me when I looked at their eyes. Another witness allegedly noticed the girls leaving the Boyden house just before the fire broke out. One girl may have been concealing something in her jacket. A few blocks down the street, the two girls were spotted again. Young Young yeah, come here, I want to talk to you for a minute. What's up? These witnesses, too, believe one of the girls may have been concealing something. If the girls did indeed murder Daphne and kidnap baby Lazan, was it for love of Lathan, or could there have been another motive? Ten months earlier, Lathan himself had been a target, a victim of an attempted holdup. Break yourself! What's up, homie? You know what time it is? I thought we was cold! Give up the damn little one, bust you! Come on, come on! Anybody moves, everybody dies! <laughs> One bullet hit Lathan, piercing his brain. When he recovered, he testified against the shooter. It's only natural to assume that there could be some possible connection there, uh, that it may be some type of retaliation. We don't want to overinflate that possibility. Uh, but again, it's unsolved, so we're trying not to uh, close any doors on it. OK, I don't think, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, However, Lathan Williams is convinced the two attacks are not connected. You know what I'm saying? Had nothing to do with it, you know what I'm saying, because of the fact that uh, they would uh, try to get at me, you know what I'm saying? My life would have been in danger, you know what I'm saying? Not, uh, you know what I'm saying, my uh, baby mama's life, you know what I'm saying? And my kid. Whatever the motive, police have no doubt that whoever killed Daphne also kidnapped Lazon. We still feel that there's hope to, to recover the baby. Obviously, we feel it's uh, still alive, and we hope with this information on a nationwide level, it can lead to some uh, uh, further leads that uh, eventually lead to an arrest. Our next Unsolved Mysteries, a deranged ex-policeman and his wife, a homemade bomb, an elementary school held hostage. At the moment of detonation, it seemed only a miracle could save the children, and many believe that is exactly what happened. Join me next time for another compelling hour of Unsolved Mysteries.